Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Stubbs, and I lead the public engagement team here at Alzheimer's Research UK. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the ninth event in our Lab Notes online series. Today, we're hearing from scientists in our Wales research network who will share the research studying the links between genes and dementia. First up, a little bit of housekeeping. So during the event, you can use the automatic subtitles and you can switch those on using the CC button at the bottom of your screen and you're able to turn them on and off as you need. We will be editing these subtitles so they are correct on the event recording and we'll also be translating them into Welsh to support any Welsh speakers who would like to find out about the dementia research taking place in Wales. This means it might take us a little bit longer to send out the links to the event recordings, but we will send them as soon as they're ready, hopefully next week sometime. If you've missed our previous events, you can watch any of them back in your own time as they are all available on our website and YouTube channel. During this event, if you would like to ask a question, you just need to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will bring up the Q&A box where you can type your question in. So before we get going, we've just got a couple of poll questions for you, which they should pop up on your screen any second. And these questions ask you about your reasons for attending today, to rate your current knowledge about dementia, and whether you've attended one of our Lab Notes events before. And these are really useful bits of information for us. Uh, it changes from event to event, but it just helps us to understand who's coming along uh, and joining us live on the day. So I'll just pause a second and give you a chance to click away and answer those. So hopefully, once we've got enough people having done that, then we can share the results with you and see who we've got joining us today. Wonderful. So people rating their knowledge of dementia research about average. Um, hopefully we can improve that for you today. Uh, people attending mostly because they have a friend or family member with dementia. Um, and we've got a good, a good number of people who've come along before. About one in three are joining for us the first time. So thank you very much to everyone who has come along today. I don't know if what it's like where you are, but the sun is out here in Cambridge. So thank you for joining us to watch along. So before we hear from two scientists today, I just want to share some brief updates from us here at Alzheimer's Research UK. So let me just get that up, there we go. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of the work that we do to build public understanding of dementia. So as a dementia research charity, funding research is the core thing that we do, but we also want to improve public understanding, try and reduce stigma, and also support our researchers to engage people outside the dementia research community with the research that they're doing. And so the Inspire Fund is one of the ways in which we do this work. And the Inspire Fund is a funding scheme which we set up to support researchers, artists, community groups, cultural spaces and really many others to carry out projects to engage people on the topic of dementia and research. We first opened the scheme in 2019 and had a really great response and loads of applications came in. Of that we were able to fund eight projects, each working in different ways to carry out public engagement. So I just wanted to highlight a few of those here today. So first up, I'm going to talk about Sondertide, who are a group of actors and playwrights who came together to explore imagination and reality with regard to dementia. On the project is uh, two people called Rosanna Miles and Kate Russell Smith, and they both have experience of parents with different forms of dementia. And like many people, they saw how dementia affected their parents' sense of reality. But they discovered that rather than denying their parents' perceptions, they could take some time to understand their reality, enjoy it and connect with them. So they've been writing and creating a stage play to help other people and audience explore this too. Development of the play has been impacted by the pandemic and the closure of theatres, but the team hope to restart rehearsals on the production very soon. But in the meantime, they've been busy producing a series of podcasts called The Dementia Adventure in which they speak to a range of people with different experiences around the condition. People with dementia, carers, speech therapists, and researchers to name just a few. So search for Dementia Adventure where you listen to your podcast to have a listen to some episodes. And we've also popped a link in the chat as well. In a different project, artist and science communicator Hannah Ayoub wanted to help visualize and bring to life dementia research. 
So she spoke with dementia researchers from a diverse range of backgrounds, finding out about them and their research. From those discussions, she's produced a series of colouring pages available in individual sheets or as a booklet, all for free. These sheets are helping people discover dementia research through art-based activities while learning about the range of projects taking place and also things like what they can do to look after their brain health. We've put a link in the chat to where you can download these or order a booklet. She's also provided support for researchers to help them find new ways to showcase their own research. She created training materials for how to make zines, which are small self-published magazines that researchers can make about their work. These will help researchers grow their skills and confidence around sharing their research and also provide ways for non-scientists to find out more about the research going on. And in the third project I wanted to highlight, uh, we have a community-based project we've been supporting um, run by the Bristol and Avon Chinese Women's Group, who've been running sessions to build awareness of dementia in the Chinese community. Before the pandemic, they were running these face-to-face -face about different topics, looking after brain health, like keeping active and eating a balanced diet. They worked with members of the community to move these events online last summer and have continued to engage with people online. This is helping to create more of a conversation in this community about dementia, tackling those particular stigmas um, around the condition and also building an understanding of practical steps people can take to look after brain health. So these are just three of the projects we've supported and you can find out more about them on our website if you're interested. And one of the reasons I'm mentioning this uh, area of our work today is that we've just recently opened the scheme for new applications. Um, and so I wanted to highlight it in case anybody watching is part of a community group or has any really good ideas for engaging people on the topic of dementia. We've refined the aims of the scheme for this year and are really keen to support projects that engage with underserved audiences on the topic of dementia, such as minority ethnic communities or marginalised or socioeconomically disadvantaged people. Also projects that work to build knowledge and engage the public with the topic of brain health, or that engage and create dialogue with people about the progress being made in dementia research. We'll be supporting applicants to meet potential partners and collaborators to grow and strengthen their ideas, as we saw how this worked really well in the projects we funded in 2019. There's lots more information online, so please do check out the website or share it with people you think might be interested. We've popped the link in the chat where you can find out more. So that's enough from me. Today, we're hearing from researchers in our Wales Research Network. So this network is one of our 15 that we support across the UK, providing funding for research, networking and collaboration, and also helping researchers to share their discoveries and progress with the public. First up, we'll have Dr. Brandoff McAllister speaking, who will talk about his work studying genes linked with Huntington's disease. Then we will hear from Dr. Sarah Carpanini about her research into how Alzheimer's risk genes affect the brain's immune system before we move to the Q&A session. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Brandoff McAllister. So welcome, Brandoff. Thank you very much, uh, Katie, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I'm assuming that's all fine. So um, today uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Huntington's disease and the work that we're doing using human genetics to understand the disease further. Um, and as well as uh, why I think it's really important to study Huntington's disease uh, in the context of the brain and dementia in general. So you may have heard of Huntington's disease. Um, it appeared recently on an episode of Call the Midwife, season seven, episode three. I highly recommend uh, that episode, actually. It's, it's very good. Uh, my mom is a huge fan of the show, uh, and uh, she was the first one to tell me uh, that Huntington's disease appeared on Call the Midwife. Um, but also, historically, one of the most famous sufferers of the disease was Woody Guthrie, uh, who is uh, an incredibly famous folk uh, singer in America, having written many pieces of music, including probably his most famous, This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land. So what actually is Huntington's disease then? So Huntington's disease, or HD, is a genetic neurodegenerative dementia. It affects about 1 in 8,000 in the UK and typically begins midlife, so usually between ages 30 to 50, although this, this does vary quite a lot, but it, it typically is quite an early onset dementia. It is fatal and there are no treatments to slow disease. And treatment plans usually consist of trying to increase the quality of life of patients and their families and trying to treat symptoms as they come about. 
Uh, symptoms are quite varied. Um, so of course, this includes dementia. In particular, processing difficulties are a really big thing in Huntington's, uh, but also a number of motor abnormalities. So uh, difficulty with coordination and uncontrollable muscle movements called chorea, uh, and a variety of psychiatric symptoms, including uh, apathy, uh, so a lack of drive to do things, depression, irritability, and in some cases, psychosis. And as I say, Huntington's disease is a neurodegeneration, and I think this is shown very uh, clearly here in this Huntington's disease brain, where you can see this marked atrophy of this area of the brain called the striatum, which is important for coordination and movement, as well as also more widespread uh, neuronal lo loss throughout the brain. So it really is a whole brain neurodegeneration that leads to dementia, among other symptoms. So Huntington's disease is genetic. Uh, about 90% of cases occur in families with a history of the disease. And there is a 50% chance to pass the disease on to children. This is known as a dominant inheritance pattern. And you can see uh, how it propagates through uh, this example family tree here. And uh, Huntington's is independent of gender. So it, it appears uh, equally in both men and women. So what causes Huntington's then? So the gene mutation that causes Huntington's disease was identified in 1993 in the Huntington gene, uh, reasonably easy to remember. Um, and everyone has two copies of this Huntington gene normally. And it's actually really important for our health. We think it's involved with uh, normal uh, nerve functioning. Um, and all of our genes are built up of four building blocks. These are A, T, C, and G. So in the Hunt so Huntington gene has a section of repeated genetic letters, C, A, and G. And it's when one of the copies of the gene has too many of these repeated C, A, Gs, this causes the gene to malfunction and this leads to Huntington's disease. So I've tried to uh, show this pictorially here. So you can see in a normal copy of the Huntington gene, you have this relatively small section of repeated CAG letters, and this isn't associated with disease, this is normal. Um, but in the expanded Huntington gene, here, you can see that there are a number of expanded CAGs. You have more of them in the gene, and this is associated with Huntington's disease. And the, mut the mutated Huntington gene makes mutant Huntington protein, and it's this mutant protein that causes neurons to die, leading to the symptoms of Huntington's disease. And neurons are killed in a number of ways, uh, protein aggregation, impaired transport in neurons, and improper gene regulation are just some examples of how neurons die in Huntington's. And the number of these CAG letters is important. So uh, normal Huntington gene sizes have about 13 to 26 repeated CAG letters, and this is normal and not associated with disease. But uh, individuals who have between 36 to 39 CAGs in a copy of their Huntington gene are at risk of developing Huntington's in their life, and people with 40 or greater CAG repeats uh, will develop Huntington's in their lifetime. And indeed, very large number of these CAG letters is actually associated with an early or even juvenile form of the disease. And it is interesting to note, and I think quite important ethically and for patients and their families, actually many people at risk for Huntington's, so in uh, HD families, opt not to get tested uh, for uh, the, the, the mutation as there currently is no treatment. So not only does or do bigger CAGs uh, dictate whether or not someone will have disease, but they also uh, strongly dictate the age at when symptoms tend to begin. So bigger CAGs mean earlier disease, usually. But what's interesting is that, and I should say that it's shown in this graph here, you can see the number of uh, CAGs in Huntington as this increases, the age at disease start decreases. But what's interesting is that if you look across any of these uh, numbers here, so for instance, at 42, you can see that some people have onset beginning in their early 20s and some people have disease in their 70s. So there's a massive difference at when people begin to have symptoms. So of course the question is, 
why. Why are people having such large differences in disease, even with the same exact mutation? What are the genetic differences that underlie early or late disease? And that's what we're really interested in and what I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, so to analyze and to study this, um, we've used a number of different techniques, but the one most recently that we've used uh, is sequencing, specifically a technique called whole exome sequencing. And this is a uh, strategy that allows us to get the exact sequence of most genes in people. So everyone has about 20,000 genes, so we get the exact sequence for most of these genes in the people that we sequence. And we've selected um, uh, the earliest people uh, who have disease at the bottom compared to, compared to their peers. So these are people who have much earlier disease than expected in, the, in orange at the bottom here, and people who have much later disease than expected at the top in green here. And the reason that we focus on the extremes is because this increases the chance of finding big genetic changes that are associated with disease. So this is sort of a, a little overview of how sequencing works. It's quite a long multi-step process, but I'll, I'll just kind of give you the highlights if you like. Um, so uh, using DNA from patient volunteers, uh, I prepare these in the lab and there's a variety of things we do. We make copies of the DNA using a technique called PCR. And we also barcode each one so that we can refer back to uh, which patient each DNA sample comes from. After these are prepared, we then put these on what's called a high throughput sequencer. Uh, it looks a bit like a fridge and this uh, allows us to sequence many patients uh, at the same time. To put it into perspective, now we can actually sequence uh, 96 uh, whole exomes at the same time uh, over the course of one or two days. Compare this back to the original human genome project where one genome took a whole year. You can see how much data that we're producing now. So uh, in our study, uh, we produced about 10 terabytes of raw data. And uh, to analyze this, we use a supercomputer, which allows us to align and then analyze these data and then use genetic techniques to learn about disease. And this is in um, uh, using supercomputing whales, which is our local uh, supercomputer here at Cardiff University. So we found uh, just as a flavor, over 8 million small changes to the genome at about 700 patients. And I should uh, specify here that the vast majority of these changes are benign. In fact, many of these changes are what makes everyone unique and individuals. Uh, so most of them are not going to be associated with disease. But what we do find is that a small number of these genetic differences are associated with disease. So for instance, we find some uh, that are associated with a later disease, and we find some that are associated with an earlier disease. And we call these uh, genetic changes modifiers because they modify the age at when symptoms begin in patients. So I'm going to give you kind of a couple of brief examples of ones that we've identified just to kind of show the types of things that we're finding and how we're working with them. So some genes in, in the body appear to be protective for Huntington's disease. So we found one gene called FAN1, and this appears to slow disease. So actually small damaging changes to this gene actually accelerate disease onset. If you like, FAN1 is usually a guardian, and if you damage it in some way, it can speed up Huntington's disease. Uh, FAN1 is, is what's called a DNA repair gene. It normally helps to keep our DNA healthy. Uh, and we think that there is a link between DNA repair with the letters, the CAG letters that we see in the Huntington gene that cause Huntington's. I should also point out that um, most of the, of the work I'm talking about here is actually free to read as a preprint here, uh, if you're interested. Um, and there's a number of ways that we're taking uh, it, things forward in FAN1. Uh, one way is by modeling the FAN1 protein, which is made from the FAN1 gene, uh, computationally. So uh, this is looking at the three-dimensional structure of FAN1. And these little circles here are uh, identified um, genetic changes in patients that are uh, associated with altered disease onset. Most of these are associated, as I say, with an earlier disease because they're damaging FAN1 in some way. Um, equally then, some genes appear to actually speed up disease. So um, in this example, um, two of our biggest uh, interesting hits are in the genes MSH3 and PMS1. 
And small damaging changes in these genes can actually slow disease down, which is very interesting. Um, these are both DNA repair genes like FAN1. Um, and th typically they help to keep DNA healthy. Um, but in the context of Huntington's disease, we think that these genes are interacting also with the CAGs in Huntington. But unlike FAN1, these genes are making neurons die more quickly. We think mechanistically what's happening is that these genes are causing the uh, the CAG to get longer in people as they age, whereas FAN1 helps to prevent that from happening and keep people uh, from developing disease uh, for, for, for a, a longer period of time. And these are just some of the genetic changes that we find in MSH3. There's lots of different ones. Uh, these are what are called loss of function mutations. So these lead to a uh, knockout of MSH3 function. And as I say, these um, are associated with a later disease because they are removing the effect of MSH3 uh, in these patients or part of the effect, I should say. And um, this is sort of one way to think about it. This is actually a published uh, scientific article, quite a good one by one of our collaborators. So it's not just me being silly. Uh, you could think of it as MSH3 and PMS1 as sort of the dark side of DNA repair. You know, usually DNA repair helps to keep our DNA healthy and happy. But in this context of Huntington's disease, uh, they, it, they can be quite damaging. So you could think of it as uh, PMS1 and MSH3 being Darth Vader uh, against uh, Luke Skywalker with uh, FAN1. Um, and the reason why these are really exciting and interesting is because if you can target these, they may be really uh, druggable. So they may be really good targets for drugs and therapy. So for instance, if you have a bad modifier that we identify um, that's associated with early Huntington's, if you could design some kind of hypothetical drug to target the gene or its resultant protein, this could slow and then delay disease, um, which is really exciting and, and something that, that we're working uh, quite hard on and lots of other people are as well. So what now? Um, so just because we've identified genes associated with disease, that's not the end. In fact, that's just the beginning. There's lots of ways that we can take these forward to learn about what they're actually doing in disease. So uh, we're doing more sequencing. We're analyzing more clinical data to make sure that we're using uh, the data that we have most effectively. Uh, we're doing, as I say, computer modeling, which I think is really exciting, and single cell analyses, uh, which is a way to look at what individual cells are actually doing uh, in, in disease. And there's also a whole bunch of functional work. So we have a mouse lab, for instance, just looking at some of the uh, modifiers that we find, and also a fly lab doing a similar thing. Uh, we can take uh, patient cells and reprogram them into induced pluripotent stem cells that allow us to grow patient nerve cells, essentially, in a dish, um, uh, as well as also uh, biochemistry as well. And I, I thought I'd just sort of end on a, on a sort of slightly bigger picture. So I, I really think that rare dementias are helping to trailblaze our understanding of the brain. And in Huntington's disease, it's still a bumpy path. There's a few rocks in the way. Uh, it's a bit windy, maybe a couple of trees. But I think we are getting there now. And um, I think that studying rare dementias is really important because it helps us understand common dementias and the brain in general. So rare dementias like Huntington's allow us to study the best ways to treat the brain, to see what types of therapies are effective uh, and how to reach the deeper parts of the brain with, with therapies, uh, which is a really important uh, concept in, in dementia, as well as also potentially approximate dosages. Uh, one thing that I think is, is very interesting is that mechanisms in neurodegeneration can overlap. So things like protein aggregation, for instance, are seen in many different dementias and neurodegenerative diseases, and of course, neuronal losses in the name, uh, and even the immune system uh, may have some overlap in, in certain diseases. So, it, you know, this isn't a vacuum. Studying one disease can apply to other diseases too. And I think it, it is also worth mentioning that Huntington's disease is part of a family of over 40 diseases with similar mutations. Many of these have neurological components, including the most common type of familial frontotemporal dementia, uh, as well as also the most common type of inherited intellectual disability in boys called Fragile X. So again, studying uh, Huntington's and rare dementias is helping us study common dementias and the brain in general.
So I just like to finish just by saying an enormous thank you to all of the HD patients and their families, uh, without whom this research would never be possible. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the researchers involved here, uh, both in Cardiff and also more widely in the UK and in the US, and also all of our uh, lovely and generous funders, in particular Air UK, for inviting me to speak here today. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. And I think we're just going to go straight to the next speaker then. So um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Carpanini, uh, who will be talking about her work in Alzheimer's disease, looking at synapses. So go ahead and take it away, Sarah. Thanks very much, Fran. That was a great talk. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. OK. So. Um, I'm going to talk in a different tact and I'm going to talk about how one particular gene might stop connections from being lost in the Alzheimer's disease brain. So we all contain a unique sequence of DNA within our bodies and genes are made up of this DNA. So this DNA is transcribed into a messenger protein called RNA. This RNA then can turn into protein and the protein are the building blocks that make up our cells. So let's look at the bottom where we can see a diagram as an example. Now, this is just showing a flower color gene. So the DNA sequence within this flower color gene determines a protein that helps make pigments. So in this case, it's a protein for purple flowers, which then produces a plant with purple flowers. This is described as the phenotype. And a phenotype is a set of observable characteristics. So why am I introducing you to all this? So basically, we have been looking at genome-wide association studies, GWAS, and these have proved vital in the studies of late onset Alzheimer's disease. So the genome is the complete set of genetic material or DNA of an organism and everybody's genome is different. So people have small differences in their DNA, which affect the proteins that the body makes. And this could determine your phenotype, how you look, your susceptibility to disease, and your response to infections. So what we want to do is we perform genome-wide association studies. And basically, these compare the genomes of people of different groups. For example, a group without a disease and a group with a disease with the, under, the underlying outcome to try and identify differences within the DNA, which could determine whether or not people have the disease. So what differences have been found in the genome of healthy people and those with Alzheimer's disease? So genome-wide association studies have now identified several genes, all shown in different colored circles here. Now, these genes can either have a low, medium, or high risk of Alzheimer's disease. Some of them are very rare, found in very few people in the population, whereas some of them are very common. Now, genes that affect your risk of Alzheimer's disease are referred to as Alzheimer's disease risk genes. So before I take you to the study that we're particularly looking at, I really want to introduce different cells. So as you know, there are many different cell types in the body. And every cell contains the complete genetic material to express everything. But genes that are being expressed are switched on. So what I mean by this is that every cell would have the capability of expressing all these genes, but the majority of the genes are off. So as an example, let's look here. So we know the pancreas makes insulin. So in the pancreas cell, the insulin gene is on, but this gene is not switched on in the eye lens or the nerve cell. So I'm particularly interested in one cell type called microglia, and this is what microglia looks like. Now they are important immune cells in the brain. By this, I mean they play a role in the immune system in fighting the response to infection. Now, interestingly, a lot of the Alzheimer's risk genes make proteins that are found in microglia. So this suggests that microglia may actually play a very important role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. So microglia have a key role within the brain. They're involved in clearing debris and waste. And this is known as a process called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis basically means to eat. 
And you can see this in the diagram here. You can see your microglia are engulfing a particle and eating it. So what is phagocytosis and what does it do? Phagocytosis allows microglia to clean up debris in order to maintain proper function and to remove synapses from neurons in order to shape the brain during development. So what do I mean by this? So we know that the brain processes information stored in networks of specialized nerve cells called neurons. And these neurons transmit information across the brain in the form of electrical and chemical signals. So these neurons need to communicate with each other. And this happens at synapses, as you can see in the picture here. So as the brain develops, you get a rather large excess of synapses that are formed, as you can see in the diagram here. By two years of age, there are many more synapses than you would ever, ever observe in an adult human brain. So much so that the brain is highly disorganized. There are connections everywhere. So the years that follow up to approximately 10 years of age, a process called synaptic pruning takes place. By this, the microglia are involved and they play a role in eating weak and underused synapses, allowing the neurons to strengthen those essential connections. So synaptic pruning by microglia during development shapes the adult brain network. So what's this got to do with Alzheimer's disease? Well, we know that synapse loss is a very early event and a key event in Alzheimer's disease. If you just look at the graph here, we can see in this one brain area, They've observed by a method from electron microscopy, 44% less synapses in Alzheimer's disease brains than in control brains. So synaptic loss occurs in Alzheimer's disease brains, causing damage to these networks. So how do we study synapses in an Alzheimer's disease relevant context? So technical advances have enabled us to isolate synapses, and these are called synaptoneurosomes. And you can see them in the images in the bottom left. So basically, we are just looking at the synapse, which is the connections between the neurons, and we're solely looking at that. So what we can do, we can bind these synaptoneurosomes to something called PH Rodo, or Frodo, for Lord of the Rings fans. This then will make the synaptoneurosomes fluoresce red, but only when they've been phagocytosed or eaten by microglia. So we can look at this over time, and what we're looking at is seeing over time, do we see an increase in red fluorescence? So the more synaptoneurosomes that are eaten by microglia, the more red we will observe. So I'm gonna have a video to show you here. So we have plates where we have seeded microglia. So the microglia are growing in the plates and we've fed them synaptoneurosomes that are attached to this red rhodo. So I'm gonna play this a few times so that you can see. So what we're looking at is we've got these microglia, we've given them synaptoneurosomes, and we want to see, can we see an increase in red fluorescence over time? And I'll play it a few times so that you can see. So as you can see, the red color is increasing over time. Play that again, so you can see that. So let's bring this back to the context of Alzheimer's risk genes. How might this affect synaptic pruning or synaptic loss in Alzheimer's disease? So that we know that microglia prune synapses by eating them. We know that synaptic loss occurs in Alzheimer's disease. We know that there are multiple risk genes that affect phagocytosis. So we're particularly interested in one called PLC gamma 2. And there's a mutation has been identified through the genome-wide association studies in this gene that has shown to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So it's shown to be protective. Now we want to know how. How is this single mutation protecting against Alzheimer's disease? So what we've done, we've isolated microglia from normal healthy mice. We've also isolated microglia from mice that have this protective mutation. We fed these microglia just normal, healthy synaptoneurosomes. So we want to see, does the protective mutation in the microglia cause any effect on synapse loss? So let's look at the graph here. You can see time across the horizontal axis and phagocytosis index on the vertical. 
By this, I mean the fluorescence. So what we're looking at, the blue line to start with, we can see that normal microglia are happy. They're eating their synaptic neurosomes, no problem at all. When you've got microglia containing this protective mutation, you have less synapses are eaten. This is suggesting that the protective mutation in PLC gamma 2 may potentially reduce the Alzheimer's risk by reducing synapse loss. This is very early days, and there are ways that we can analyze this further. So what we want to look at, we've looked at microglia from healthy mice and those who are healthy but with the mutation. We then want to have a look at different synapses. So we can isolate synaptic neurosomes from healthy mice and from Alzheimer's mice. And we want to see whether there's any changes at the synapse that could also affect the uptake by the microglia. We can also make synaptic neurosomes from human brain tissue as well to see the, what we are observing in the mouse, can we also see in the human? So I'd really like to thank you for listening. This work was done in collaboration with Megan Torvell, Emily Maguire, and Tom Phillips, and wouldn't have been possible without funding from ARUK. So I'm going to stop share, and then I'm going to introduce Katie again, who is going to lead the Q&A session. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Bran. Those were really fantastic presentations. There. So absolutely brilliant. So just everybody watching, do submit questions through the Q&A. We've got some that were submitted in advance. That I think I can start with. Um, so I think one of the things that I think we want to cover off quite early is that at the moment in this, you both talking about risk genes. And Bran, you talked a little bit about genes that cause Huntington's. But we've had a question about the genes that might cause Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I wondered if you could maybe explain a little bit about that. Somebody saying that in their family, many people are getting Alzheimer's at quite a young age, so in their 50s and early 60s. So is that different to the risk genes that you were talking about, Sarah? Yes, it is. So we know that there have been causative mutations identified in three genes for early onset Alzheimer's disease. Now this occurs for individuals who are less than 65 years of age. But it's important to note that this is only accounts for 1% of all Alzheimer's cases. So the risk genes that we are looking at are in the late onset, where we haven't found any single gene mutations that can cause this. What we're looking at is how you have multiple genes with multiple changes can all have low levels of effect or combined could have a higher effect. Yeah, it's it's a bit like so in, in Huntington's, you know, you have one gene which leads to disease and very much in sporadic Alzheimer's, you might be looking at 100 or 200 genes. And even though each effect is very small together, these can generate, you know, a, a total risk for developing Alzheimer's. So it, it, it's a lot more complicated, um, which, which makes it harder to study. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's really key that for the, for the most part, most people, it's these small, small changes. Um, but thinking about the people where it might be this more causative mutation in Alzheimer's, Bran, you mentioned about there's testing for Huntington's disease. I wonder if either of you could comment about is there any testing for people who might have this really strong family link, so very mm -hmm. early onset forms of Alzheimer's. Is there a way that they could get tested? So for the... Um... For, forgive me, I, I am an HD uh, researcher, but it's based on, on my knowledge of, of Alzheimer's. So uh, for the small percentage of people with the early onset, one of the three genes, there is uh, genetic counseling that is available for that. Uh, and it's the type of thing that if you think that is relevant, you, you know, you can get genetic counseling and testing for that. Um, for other types, um, there's not really any clinical tests yet uh, there are some preclinical tests and I have to say these are preclinical they're used for research and these are things called uh, we call them polygenic risk scores so they're the type of things where if we take someone's entire genome we can sort of try to add up the sum of the kind of smaller risks across the genome to give you sort of an overall percentage for approximate risk, but it doesn't take into account uh, gene interactions or of course, uh, you know, how someone gro is grown up or raised. So they're kind of a bit, they're a bit of a bodge currently. So yeah, it might be in many years to come, but at the moment for most yeah. people, there isn't testing available. Wonderful. Um, and I wonder, Bran, actually, this, we've got another one that came in advance that was asking about, is there anything that can be done to prevent a gene's adverse impact taking effect? 
such as gene therapy. So I don't know if uh, so um, Huntington's is there anything? So th uh, this is a fantastic question. So actually, one of the treatment modalities that is really, really being pushed at the moment in Huntington's are uh, called uh, antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs. And these essentially target the mutant Huntington gene, which we know is causative, and try to essentially remove it or clear it. Um, and this is potentially a really good method for treatment of, of dementias. There are a number of issues with it, though. Um, one is that it's a really big molecule, so it's difficult to pass the blood-brain barrier. So these treatments at the moment are having to be given intrathecally, which isn't the most pleasant for patients. Um, but this type of, if you can find, you know, genes that are associated with disease, if you can target them, you know, if you have a therapeutic that can target either the gene or the protein that it makes, then absolutely. Wonderful. So yeah. again, that's more difficult in terms of Alzheimer's because we know some genes for the early onset. And there are studies where people are starting to try and look in the lab to see if they can do gene therapy. But at this stage, it is looking at cells in a dish and seeing yeah. what we can do. So it might be the future. That's where we'd like to go. But we're not at that stage yet where there are things available. Mm. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and Brand, listening to you, you were talking about some of the work that you've been doing and you've identified these genes that alter when somebody might start to develop symptoms mm -hmm. and what I found was interesting was that the three genes you mentioned were all to do with DNA repair mm -hmm. so it's a genetic fault that happens in Huntington's and the genes that seem to influence the time at which it comes on is is um, are to do with DNA did that surprise you were you expecting to, to see other things in there so um we were actually, this was kind of a surprise. So I wasn't involved in the very, very first genetic study. I was involved in some, some, some of the later stuff. So the original was in 2015, but I sort of joined in 2016. So it was just after that. Um, and it was kind of shocking. We were expecting to find other things, but actually most of the genetic signal so far has been in DNA repair. And as I sort of alluded to at the end, there are other uh, similar diseases with uh, these sort of repetitive bits of, of genetic code uh, and we think there may be some overlap actually between the diseases and how they work with dna repair so we're still sort of trying to untangle what it all means uh but it, it is it, it is quite interesting how dna repair is involved brilliant thank you um and i think i'm going to come to you now sarah you mentioned something towards the end of your talk that i thought was potentially quite interesting so you talked about how you've been making these things these synaptic neurosomes so how you can study synapses and you mentioned at the end that you could make them from human brains and I just wondered how you do that are these brain samples when people are having surgery or is it uh, post-mortem so once people have passed away how does it work so you can get them from post-mortem tissue so if people like a lot, a lot of research into human disease, especially human Alzheimer's, is just not possible without people donating brains to research. And they go through the brain banks and there's so many ethics and things that are involved to make sure they are being used for the correct thing and for the correct studies. And basically our research wouldn't be possible without things like this. And we can apply, and it is a full application. It's not just saying, I'd like some. You need to apply, why do you need some samples? What are you going to use them for? What will the outcome of this be? So that is down the line. That is something that we'd like to do. But you don't just jump in straight away and say, can I have some human tissue? You'd really want to do the studies first and say, this is what we're seeing. This is in our context. Is this still relevant for disease? Fantastic. That's, that's really, really good to hear that that's potentially to come. So we've had a question come in live from Julie. Um, I think, Brian, this would be one for you. What if you do not have a family history of Huntington's and a family gets it? What exactly would this mean? So, um, so as I mentioned, about 90% is within families. Um, the other 10% is what we call de novo, which means new, essentially. And um, in case of the genetics, um, essentially what it means is that some people in the population have Huntington genes with a slightly elevated number of CAGs, and these don't cause disease. But what happens is that these can get larger over time intergenerationally. So it's the type of thing where even though the parent 
it's perfectly healthy, it's fine. There could be an expansion. The CAGs could get bigger, and uh, this causes Huntington's to occur. And one thing that that is worth mentioning is that there is a genetic phenomenon known as anticipation in Huntington's, where Huntington's tends to get earlier and earlier intergenerationally. Uh, so, um, and that's just due to the repeat expanding. So we think it's the same mechanism involved. Really good question. Very interesting. Yeah, the fact that it kind of that bit of the gene just grows each time it's passed on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So um, coming to you, I think, Sarah, again, to think a bit more about uh, synapses in, in the brain and their importance. So is the hope that if you can understand why they're being eaten, is it that you're trying to protect them and kind of stop them from being eaten? Is that the ultimate aim of, of where your research is trying to go? Yes, definitely. So we know that synapse loss is a very early event in Alzheimer's disease. And by the time somebody turns up in the clinic presenting with symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, there has been an awful lot of synapse loss that has happened before. So we need to understand when is synapse loss happening? How is it happening? And can we venture down the line, identify people early enough so that we can start treatment before they present with symptoms? Because we are talking decades in advance. So we need to understand what's going on. Mm. Is it happening? What is happening? And can we treat it at the early stages? Because it might be the case that if you then try and treat it after you've lost all your synapses, we're looking too late. And, and one thing that I'd like just to add to that in the context of Huntington's is that actually uh, when patients be become symptomatic, they've actually lost over 50% of the striatum in their brain. So, you know, these are, you know, big changes occur over time in the brain. It's really important that we can uh, look and track them over time because the earlier you treat these things, likely the, the better the outcome. Yeah, wonderful. Kind of sticking slightly with that theme, um, Sarah's uh, sent a question in that says, if you had genetic testing and it showed that you would get Alzheimer's, would there be studies that you could be involved in uh, in order that you might be able to be part, like get some sort of experimental treatment or any treatments for slowing it down. I don't know if any of you are aware of any studies going on like that. It's not really my field. It's not something that I could advise on. Um, I'm sure there are things that way and there are, like we, well, you're our research charity to go through, but there are other charities like Alzheimer's Society who might be able to advise and to point people in the right direction. Yeah. I think I, I think I've heard of a study. Um, I think it's called Diane, and it's all about these families that have Alzheimer's running through them really strongly. And I think people in those families can get involved in research studies. But I think getting involved in research would be is a really fantastic thing to do, whether or not you think you have a risk of Alzheimer's, because you know in these studies we need people who don't have a risk or don't have dementia currently, and actually we can learn a bit about what's happening in the brain. So, yeah. Um, we're always promoting a service called Join Dementia Research and hopefully one of my colleagues can pop a link to that in the chat um, if people are interested in getting involved with research because there might be studies on there that you could take part in. Um, I've got had a question come through. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer this one. Um, and I think it's, it's around this kind of inheritance and gender thing. So yeah, I think Brian, you slightly mentioned this with Huntington's, but um, Anne is asking in our family, it's mainly been males with dementia and only recently a female all on one side of the family. Is it likely that other family members may be affected? Um, I guess, I think that's quite a hard one to, to answer really, isn't it? Because it, there doesn't seem to be genetically a difference between men and women. No. No. Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm not really in the position to answer that, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's, it's a good question, though. I just don't have, yeah. have, have the capacity, I'm afraid. Mm. It's a good question, and it's interesting as well mm. to know. Mm. But I just don't think the studies are there at the moment that people have looked through. Mm. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it is potentially possible. Uh, I mean, there are, there are genetic differences between men and women, you know, in terms of chromosomes, X, Y chromosome. But again, I, I don't have the, uh, the, the knowledge there to know for sure. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. So having a few more questions come through, let me just have a little look at those. Um, so I think, I wonder if we could explore a little bit more about early diagnosis and the potential for screening. So at the moment, you know, we don't really have screening programs for dementia for any form, really. Um, 
but do you think that if we did all the research that that could be something that could happen i wonder if you could speculate on that yes yeah, so there are a lot of groups now looking for like blood-based biomarkers as well. so just being able to take a blood sample from somebody and to say well look we're identifying these changes within your blood there's a strong chance that you might develop dementia mm. um that's really where we'd want to go there are other ways you can do it so people can do csf based studies looking at cerebrospinal fluid but obviously that's a lot more invasive to the patient and then brain biopsies but you're not going to be biopsying the brain of people so blood is where we need to be at and there are a lot of studies so the dri uh, the dementia research institute they've got biomarker studies going on as well at the moment just trying to see can we find a way that we can identify these people earlier on? Mm, and and there's there's a lot of research going on into uh, symptoms and pre symptoms of dementia, so potentially risks. Uh, and there's uh, there's an enormous amount of data that's coming out of larger studies. Uh, so one of the ways that these are being looked at is machine learning, because if you if you give a computer tons and tons of data, you know, it can actually find patterns in, in that. And in that we, there's also potentially a way that we can use to predict uh, dementia in, in people who potentially are at risk. Yeah, and I think probably worth me doing a bit of uh, self-promotion for one of our big projects that we've got going on. So here at the charity, we've got uh, a large initiative called the Early Detection of Neurodegeneration Initiative. Um, and that's trying to find some of the subtle clues that our brains might be giving off that something is going wrong. So at the moment, we're diagnosing when there are clinical features. So we're looking at things like brain scans and seeing what's actually happening in the brain. Um, and we're picking it up too late. So actually, are there changes to things like our sleep or how we walk or how we might you know, use language that things like smartwatches or your mobile phone could pick up? And if we can bring all this data together, could we spot those early patterns and find a way to make those indications that then, you know, people have information to talk to their doctors to kind of they spot those earlier signs. And then that, you know, initially will help research. But ultimately, the goal is that we have these effective treatments. We're picking people up really early and um, and we're giving people the best chance of, of having a really good quality of life. So, yeah, it, it's big data. It's machine learning. It's it's more more work going on really in the dementia mm -hmm. research field and, and and i think that development of of clinical phenotypes and symptoms is really important like in again i'm going back to huntington's disease very briefly but uh in in huntington's uh for instance uh, ocular motor impairments so small changes to uh the way that the eyes move is actually now a really interesting area because it's obviously non-invasive and it's a way potentially that we could use to sort of see you know, disease ahead of actual symptom starts. So trying to learn about these in dementia in general, I think is, is really important. Brilliant. So as we're kind of, we're getting close to the top of the hour. So I'm just wondering if I could ask you from your position as dementia researchers, what is the most exciting area of research to you? So Sarah, I'll come to you for, put you on the spot, <laughs> give you no time <laughs> at all to think of that. What excites you most about dementia research at the moment? Oh, ooh, that's quite a difficult question. Um, what? So I think whatever you ask a scientist, they're going to say the, what excites me the most is what I work on. And that's what gets us going. So I love the synapse. That's what I work on. And that's what I've worked on for years. Um, I'd love working in dementia research. I just think there are so many great teams out there. The funding is really coming through now that we are, you really feel like you're making a difference when you go to work that there's a goal, this is what you're doing, you're helping people. Um, and really that's that's the best part that I think for me is knowing that you're doing something, you are helping, <laughs> however small it may be. Yeah, um, so my, my science-y part, I suppose, um, gosh, there's so many things. I, I really have a huge interest in single cell sequencing. I think it's a fantastic way to actually dissect what's going on in individual cells, which is, absolutely crazy that you can get enough like genetic material from a tiny tiny cell to actually get data on your computer i just find that absolutely insane and just to sort of echo what uh, what sarah was saying um the the dementia field i think is is such an amazing area to work in in huntington's disease we have admittedly usually not when i'm at home but we have a clinic that's downstairs that sees patients you know you can meet patients and their families and it's a really tight 
knit community between clinicians, uh, the, the HD families and, and patients who want to take part in research, um, and, and obviously the, the, the researchers. And it's really exciting to, to, to be a part of the dementia research community in general. Brilliant. A ringing endorsement indeed. So that's, that's absolutely wonderful to hear. So in the interest of time, I think we are going to begin to wrap up. So I just want to say a huge thank you to both of our speakers, to Sarah and Bran, for giving such interesting talks and for taking all the questions here tonight. So thank you very much to you both. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. Um, bye. Thanks very much. Bye. So if the audience just sticks with me, couple of minutes longer oh i think better video issues sorry about that a uh, very one one minute longer uh, we're just going to do a few more things so we've got a couple of poll questions that we'd love you to answer which should give us uh, an indicator of how you found tonight so those have popped up on your screen now and they just uh, ask whether you've enjoyed the event, would you recommend these to your friends and family? And uh, do you think you might come along again in future? So putting you on the spot, but really useful feedback for us. So I'll give you just a second or two to answer those. So if we've had enough people answer them, I wonder if we could get the results on screen. And quite positive, wonderful. So you do recommend, you would recommend these to friends and family. You feel like you've learned something and you would plan to attend again in future. So that's absolutely wonderful. It helps us to understand how these are going and how we can improve. And also we'll be sending a feedback survey to you tomorrow um, to find out about more information, more feedback on um, how we can continue to improve these events. So please do feel that and we'd really appreciate any feedback that you can give us. And then once the videos are edited up and the subtitles are all sorted in both English and Welsh, we'll send that through to you likely to be sometime next week. And then the next event in our Lab Note series is taking place on the 3rd of August at midday and features researchers from our Scotland Research Network. And they'll be talking to us about these vital connection points, synapses that Sarah mentioned earlier, and how these are affected in dementia and the work that they're doing to study them. So do come along next month for that really interesting session and you can find out more on our website and sign up there. I know there are some questions that we, we aren't always able to answer. Sometimes we, we can't always answer clinical type questions or more personal questions. So if you would like some answers to those, do, uh, do get in touch with our Dementia Research info line. They can answer questions, help you sign up to research studies and signpost you to other sources of information and support. So I would recommend getting in touch with them as they can really help. So as we close, I just want to say a huge thank you for joining us today. I hope you've found it interesting and useful and we'll come along again in future for another event in the series. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>